Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, tonight I want to present a presidential address on recent scientific research into the audition system in Australia. We have the. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the audition system, and that includes myself, it continually the information continually changes. And in fact, tonight I'll be telling you about the uh, a recent decade, the most recent decade of research into this subject, which has substantially increased our knowledge of the audition in Australia. But this is general information about the audition. It's about 42 million years long, and the Ordovician system is actually the bunch of the, the strata that was deposited or intruded or extruded during the time. So it's the rocks. The Ordovician period is the time. So that's that slight distinction that we have. So the Ordovician system includes all the rocks, normally you think just sedimentary rocks, but it also includes volcanics and intrusives, such as granites and so forth, although there's not all that many of them of those in Australia at the time. The Ordovician now extends between 485.4 uh, million years, plus or minus nearly two, and at the base, and 443.8 million years, plus or minus 1.5 at its top. And those are very precise measurements um, derived from generally isotopic analysis of zircon grains by quite sophisticated um, equipment uh, called the shrimp um, system. Uh, the system is in, divided into three series, lower, middle and upper, and each of those is then further subdivided into stages of which there are seven. Uh, the Canadian at the top is the smallest and the Darawillian and the Katian uh, in the middle and upper Ordovician are uh, the longest of the stages. And um, the Ordovician system actually came about as a compromise. It was set up by Charles Lapworth in 1879. He was the professor of uh, geology at uh, Birmingham, I think it was, and uh, there was a great controversy at the time that the underlying uh, unit, the Cambrian, set up by Adam Sedgwick, uh, and the overlying unit, the Silurian, set up by Sir Roderick Murchison of the British Geological Survey, uh, actually overlapped. And they overlapped precisely where the Ordovician was. And so um, Lapworth proposed this compromise to enable um, the rocks to be worked out and the argument to be pretty much settled. The Ordovician world is very much different from, from today's world. Um, due to the... Uh, various uh, plate tectonics that were involved, and Australia looked very little, it was quite unlike what it does look like today, and that is, there is Australia there, and you'll see that the western two-thirds had some resemblance to Australia today, but the eastern third was basically underwater, with a few volcanic islands. And so that's why it looks like that. It was part of the supercontinent known as Gondwana, which was centred at that time on the South Pole. The North Pole area was basically all water, as far as we know, unless something was there and has subsequently disappeared in plate tectonics. So this is a, a normal mole with, with projection for the early Ordovician, and this is one for the late Ordovician. And you can see how things, particularly there's Australia again, how it has moved north of the Paleo Equator at that time and continues to move today. And these views are centred on the South Pole, there and there. And similarly for the early and late Ordovician. And particularly in the Ordovician, if you were there, you would not have seen land plants to any great extent. They would have been extremely rare. The majority of life lived in marine habitats. Very little terrestrialisation was around that we know of. Of course, the fossils don't always um, reveal the full extent of life as it was. Um, a strange thing that we've re realised in recent years is that sea surface temperatures in the early Ordovician, in the equatorial um, areas, were of the order of 40 degrees C. That's around about 10 degrees C greater than today, enough to start cooking your, your sea life. Um, and this 
uh, is quite a strange thing. It's been found in several different parts of the world, both through isotopic analysis of, um, of um, oxygen uh, ratios. The carbon dioxide uh, level was between 14 and 22 times present atmospheric levels. So certainly there was a greenhouse effect um, operative in the early to middle Ordovician, but by the time of the late Ordovician, we were into ice house conditions, and in fact there was a glaciation um, that was substantially distributed in the Fernandia. Next one, please. Um, in Australia, the Ordovician rocks are predominantly sedimentary in origin. There are significant amounts of volcanic rocks in some parts of eastern Australia, particularly in the central west of this state, and they're distributed throughout the continent in every state and territory. All ages of Ordovician rocks have been found in Australia, but the Hernantian, that topmost small bit, um, cold water, the ice house conditions, they're relatively <coughs> scarce um, there. And they host substantial economic deposits, particularly the Victorian goldfields. All of the Victorian goldfields and slates in the Ballarat, Bendigo area and surrounding areas um, are full of Ordovician fossils. The other area of substantial um, gold and copper deposits are in the central west of New South Wales, where the um, Big Cadia, Cowell, North Parks, and Peak Hill Tamingley um, mines and mineral districts are in fact hosted in Ordovician um, sedimentary uh, volcanic rocks and uh, volcanic plastic rocks. Um, in the Amadeus, there are significant, although now substantially depleted, um, deposits of oil and gas fields in Ordovician reservoirs. And the other important thing is that the Ordovician rocks in Australia have yielded um, a significant, or globally significant, um, zonation formed by graptolites, over 30 graptolitic zones, some as low as, as condensed as 500,000 years are known, and they form the basis of the Pacific province. Next one, please. So, we shall go through fairly quickly, and not everywhere, because we don't have time, uh, the distribution of rocks of Ordovician age throughout Australia. And we will specifically be focusing on rocks and fossils and other um, aspects of the Ordovician that have been uh, reported on over the past decade. So this is really bringing the Ordovician up to date um, based on, um, on those discoveries. Um, in the Carnarvon Basin in far, far western West Australia, in the central part, there are possible Ordovician rocks, but the majority of Ordovician rocks occur in the canyon, so we'll look there. Uh, in the Northern Territory, we've got Ordovician in the subsurface, these blue areas in the subsurface, in, mainly in, found in well intersections, petroleum and mineral exploration wells. In the Arafura Basin offshore, there's some um, small, fairly small scattered occurrences in various basins in the central part of the Northern Territory, but the largest uh, amount of Ordovician rocks shown in orange for outcrop is in the Amadeus Basin in the centre of the country. Um, again, there's some more undercover uh, Ordovician rocks have been found in the Warburton Basin beneath the um, overlying Cooper Basin in um, the eastern, northeastern corner of South Australia. The Georgina Basin, which uh, spans the Northern Territory Queensland border, contains some very nice outcrop of Ordovician rocks. There's a little bit of outcrop in the um, middle part of Queensland, but the majority of uh, Ordovician outcrop is in the um, areas central west and the uh, central Victorian area, um, and that's uh, got a lot of um, economic interest as well as um, some really nice fossils which I'll be dealing with. And parts of Tasmania, um, again, lots of limestone now down there of Ordovician age, a few others. Um, you'll see, whoops, sorry. Oh, sorry. You'll see here on the map uh, what I was discussing on the paleogeography, and that is that the eastern third of the continent was all pretty much underwater. It's an area known as the Tasmanides, and it comprises several what we call origins, or what used to be known as fold belts, which um, uh, have been accreted onto the continental margin, the continental blocks, which form the majority of the western two-thirds of the continent. Next one, please. 
So our prior knowledge um, for, for many years of the ordination in Australia was known from this volume, um, published by Barry Webby and a host of other um, experts of time in 1981, and uh, it was published 40 years ago, and it's now out of print. So, um, but it provides the basic information on a lot of the stratigraphy. It was supplemented in 2000, another paper that Barry and co-authors wrote, um, looking at mainly the fossil record, and this chapter, this uh, extended over the entire um, geological record, but this chapter on ordination paleobiogeography of Australasia was, um, was put together by Barry and colleagues. So they were the two um, primary um, sources of information until more recently. Next one, please. And that has been supplemented in the last decade by three substantial works, uh, volumes done on the, um, on the geology of various states and territories, which contains substantial information on the ordination. Geology of Queensland, Geological Evolution of Tasmania, and of the mineral resources of the Northern Territory. Next one, please. So, um, all right, well, we'll continue now our trip across, uh, starting off in the Canning and heading eastwards. Next. Okay, the Canning Basin in northwest Western Australia, the Ordovician record is largely undercover and has been only recognised in intersections of which there are multiple uh, wells being drilled, mainly for um, stratigraphic purposes as well as petroleum exploration. You've only got a little bit of uh, outcrop actually on the north, northern margin of the, um, of the basin. Um, and so all of these extend, all of the uh, information that we um, base our knowledge of the automation on is substantially from, un, from the subsurface. This column here relates to the um, rock outcrop, but you can see that the subsurface extends right through the entire automation and into the succeeding uh, solarium. Um, so this slide, should, no, that's fine, what, just one, good. This is our first fossil slide, and we see some beautiful um, images, SEM images, of conodonts. Conodonts are very distinctive in the Ordovician. Uh, they're the remains, the hard parts, of a small eel-like animal, only in its, its <coughs> appearance, not in any relation to eels. Um, a, a group that's a phylum that's totally extinct and it um, persisted from the middle or late Cambrian right through to the Triassic and then died out. But in the Ordovician they are particularly useful as the basis for um, defining various zones and my colleague Yongyi Zhen has worked out a sequence of zones through the Canning Basin based on these various conodont elements. And you can see they're extremely distinctive, very easily separable if you know what you're doing. And so that's the basis for a um, much more precise um, biostratigraphic subdivision of the Canning Basin. Next slide, please. Um, and there's more you can do with using conodonts in conjunction with the um, zircon dating that I mentioned. Um, using this um, strange acronym here, CAID TIMS, um, of using ratios of uranium to lead in zircons, very, very small, precise amounts, to determine age dates, absolute age dates, on the basis of half-lives. And fortuitously in the Canning, and it's one of the few places where this happens in Australia, you actually find ash beds from various volcanic eruptions We've never found the volcanoes, but the ash beds are there, interbedded in the sedimentary sequence that's got the conodonts in it. So we can match up the ages with the conodonts and get a very precise zonation. And this has actually been used in the calibration of the global time scale, particularly for this area in the uh, lower ordination, the flow in and into the dependium, because we've got an example here at 470.18, plus or minus 130,000 years. When you think going back that time, and the precision that you've got, um, it's, it's really quite amazing. And then that can be tied in 
to this planet on its own, which is then correlated worldwide. So that's an amazing um, piece of, um, uh, of research combining both uh, absolute age dating and the Conodont age dating in Canning Basin, done in 2018. Next slide, please. And, and I mentioned that there was going to be something for almost any, everybody in this, and here we have something for the botanists. And this is um, some microphytoplankton, um, various bacteria, and there's actually a recent publication and a potentially um, a possible land plant origin from charified algae um, from a well intersection in the, um, or two well intersections in the Canning Basin. These spore like microfossils are intermediate in, in morphology between confirmed land, early land plant spores in the Darawillian, the middle of the basin and early ones in the Ferongian, which is the top of the Cambrian, of uncertain relationship. So that's quite, um, quite a, a significant uh, paper. And look at the, the preservation of these spores here. For something that is of the order of 480, 480 million years. That's pretty amazing. It's because these areas of Australia have never had substantial amounts of burial and they have never had substantial amounts of tectonism, folding and contortion in the western part of the continent that we get such excellent preservation. And speaking of preservation, the next slide shows some further examples of these. And these ones are middle ordination, Darawillian in age. And look at the Preservation, 20 microns is the, the scale, but these things, as fresh as almost yesterday, of, um, of uh, various sorts of cryptospores, and, uh, and it's not something that I'm overly familiar with, but um, they were found uh, throughout four different wells in the camp. Next slide, please. We'll move now to the Amadeus Basin in the centre of the country, and we can see some actual rock outcrop. Not all of this is Ordovician, some of it is Cabonian, but essentially the area is comprised of a series of uh, folds, and you can see anticlines and synclines here, and that um, Landsat image is this central part here, and again, conodonts have been used to subdivide the um, stratigraphy, and some of them are identical, next slide please, to those in the Canning Basin. And again, the same one, uh, Jumidontus, no, sorry, uh, go back. Uh, Jumidontus gananda, um, here, very distinctive one. Um, these coniforms, not so distinctive, but they've all been worked out by my colleague, Yong Yi Shen. Um, Prionitis amadius, as the name suggests, comes from the Amadeus Basin, and, and so on. And these ones from the Horn Valley siltstone, 31 genera and 46 species are known in a major monographic work that's uh, hopefully to be published later this year. And um, that shows the beautiful preservation. And going on with the Amadeus now, we've got some macrofossils, some, some uh, trilobites. It's actually very rich in various forms of trilobites in what's called the stairway sandstone, which lies above that um, unit which we've just looked at the conodonts from, the Horn Valley, uh, including the largest known Australian trilobite, possibly the third largest trilobite known in the world. We're talking nearly a metre here. That's a mighty big trilobite, um, which is fairly well, fairly nicely preserved. Next slide, please. Um, and other components of the benthic flora, the faunas, which comprise these middle Ordovician or Darawillian um, faunas in the stairway uh, sandstone mainly, um, are uh, gastropods, snail shells, various forms of mollusk, and some brachiopods here. There used to be an idea that the, there was a seaway right through the centre of Australia to the Canning Basin, joining up the Amadeus Basin with the Canning Basin, so the two basins we've just discussed. However, it's been determined now from various studies that actually there is a, 
a barrier between the two. There is a sedimentological barrier, um, which means that sediments flowing into the Amadeus did not flow into the canning. And furthermore, all of the fauna that is now being described here, the trilobites, brachiopods, and mollusks, shows no similarity at species level between the two basins, which you would expect if there was a seaway right too. However, the conodonts are found the same because they are pelagic things and they could actually float around and get around. So that's why we no longer think that the Larapintine Seaway is a valid concept. Next slide, please. The other astounding and very scientifically significant thing that we found in the Amadeus Basin is some of the earliest fish in the geological record. And these ones are of middle Ordovician age, and there are vertebrate microfossils which match up in part with the macrofossils that have been found back in the 1970s uh, from the stairway sandstone. And here are some um, shark like chondrolithian scales from that same level. And um, you can see that they're um, remarkably well preserved in SEM uh, things. They are um, a new genus and species, and they're the stratigraphically oldest um, microsquamous, which is just basically small scale um, shark like uh, scales. Uh, they predate the first body fossils of this group by 50 million years and are 40 million years older than the first fo fossil teeth of this group. So that's quite an outstanding, uh, outstanding discovery made, again, quite recently within the last decade. Next slide, please. Moving into some of the basins that are uh, north of the um, the Amadeus, so I'll just show you this one because we can't deal with all of them. And it, this particular basin, which is the Daly Basin, has just got one Ordovician unit there. And we know it's Ordovician because of the canadons. And these canadons, shown here in glorious full colour, are basically pristine. They have not been cooked up because the area has not been covered by anything since the Ordovician. And um, these things are honey coloured, they're transparent beautifully preserved fossils, yet to be described, but certainly worthy of a paper in itself. Next slide, please. Let's move now into New South Wales. So continuing our eastward progression, and we're looking at what's called the Nolta Shelf. It's an area out um, basically just north and west of Broken Hill, and it is the very margin of the Cretonic paleo continent of Australia. And here we have um, a, a sort of a discontinuous series of outcrops, so that um, uh, the first thing we'll show you the stratigraphy here, starting off in the Cambrian, going through the early part of the Ordovician with this quartzite, and succeeded up into the latter part of the early Ordovician by some um, uh, carbonates, or limestones, uh, interbedded with sandstones and so forth, which do have canadons in them. Um, and we've got canadons in these groups and particularly in these ones here. If we have the next slide, we'll see where these are, where they fit in. And they're all over the... No, go back one, please. They're all over the place, so we don't have a continuous geological section. So it's a matter of trying to match everything up. We do this again with using the fossils to try and um, resolve this stratigraphy. But the important one that I'd like to draw your attention to tonight is one called the Candy Tank Limestone. And you can see from this green boundary line here, which subdivides the Cambrian, or the Furonbrian, the topmost series of the Cambrian, from the basal series of the Ordovician, the Trendotian, that this limestone straddles that boundary. If we go to the next slide, we'll see the rationale behind that. It's only a tiny little outcrop, really. There's 200 metres. So it's a really small outcrop. It was first found in 1971, but only recently, 2017, was uh, my colleague Yongyi Zhen um, was able to find a codot called Iapetignathus, and the actual species is Iapetignathus fructivagus. It doesn't look much. In fact, A, B, C, D, and E is the thing. They've been knocked around. They've had a lot of bits and pieces broken off them. But they're distinct enough to be able to relate this 
to the same species as occurs at the globally defined Canberra Ordovician boundary in Newfoundland and also found in South America. So this, the presence of this uh, coded on here defines accurately the fact that we are now in the basal most Canberra uh, Ordovician at 485.5 or 4 million years. These other ones are um, associated with the um, other two um, known, um, or other three known, uh, groups of candidates distinctive of this time, cordylators, with, um, with all these sort of bar-like uh, projections and denticles, so forth. Not looking very little like this, but anyway, this is a very, very substantial um, discovery made in the most recent decade, 2017. Next slide, please. We'll move now to all the fold belts and the origins which were accreted to the east margin of the continent. So we've just been looking at the Delamarian origin out here, and that's where the, um, the Nalta Shelf is. It extends down into the western two-thirds of Tasmania, and there is a dirty big fault uh, which separates the eastern third of Tasmania from the western third in the early Paleozoic. We'll also be looking in successive slides at all the uh, succession in New South Wales going into Victoria, which had volcanic island chains separated, and, and they were in the tropics from those, um, those uh, reconstructions I showed you in the second slide. We know that Australia at this time was within 10 to 20 degrees of the Paleo Equator. So these are volcanic islands with coral reefs, some of the earliest known coral reefs at the time. And they have got large um, offshore deep basin deposits in the Ordovician uh, contemporaneous with these. And then there's some deposits in Queensland, which we'll only have time to look at one or two, and going down Tasmania, we'll see that. And you can see how all this area was joined up to northern Victoria land of Antarctica prior to uh, the separation of Gondwana back around about 100 million to 84 million years ago. Um, New Zealand was somewhere a bit off here, and so um, all of this was sort of uh, joined up quite distinctly differently from today. Next slide, please. Okay, looking at Tasmania, and there's only been one really, uh, one significant paper on Ordovician fossils in the last decade, but it describes a beautifully preserved um, Trilobite, uh, Grava Calamini, Bakeri, um, from Guns Plains in northern Tasmania. Um, next slide, please. Right. Graptolites, uh, one of the most important groups of fossils um, that define the Ordovician Pacific province of Graptolites. And they are a very diverse group in the Ordovician. They change shape um, and form very, very quickly. That's why they're excellent for um, being used biostratigraphically. And here we show several of the uh, Ordovician candidates known from New South Wales. Now, Ordovician candidates from New South Wales were last studied to any extent back in the 1960s. And only recently have we gotten back onto them. And very unfortunately, a couple of years ago, um, one of our graptolite experts died suddenly, unexpectedly, and ways too early. But, um, and he was a co-author of this paper um, on, um, on early Ordovician um, graptolites. Graptolites um, used to be thought of as being totally extinct. They th it was thought that their record extended from the very, very base of the Ordovician through the Silurian and just into the Devonian. But in recent years, they've actually found two or three genera of related, directly related um, animals, extant animals, deep water animals, which they have been able to say are now conodont related, very closely conodont related. Okay, Grapplite related, Grapplite related. So they are, are no longer viewed as an extinct fire, surprisingly. Really small, um, receptacles for polyp-like animals, so they're colonial. So each of these things is 
um, a multiplicity of animals, all in, uh, in a group. Um, these, these are the early Ordovician ones that um, mainly from Gunning Land out in the Central West. Uh, and right. just go back a couple, please. Yes. And uh, most recently, in fact, September 2020, it was published, um, a remarkably um, remarkable discovery was made by Geological Survey of New South Wales geologists right near to the Albury um, area, Holbrook. Holbrook Albury area, uh, very far south uh, New South Wales, um, and these particular uh, little um, isograptid like uh, animals were found. Uh, they are basal Darawillians, so we know precisely where they are, they are sitting in the, um, in the uh, sequence from their shape, and um, they have associated conodonts on the bedding plate. Again, we can group the two together. Next slide, please. Aha, yes. Now, these ones are mainly late Ordovician, and immediately you'll see, even to quite the untrained eye, you'll, you'll see an immediate difference in the shapes and so forth. These ones often have, uh, they're called bicereal. In other words, all the saw teeth, all the little um, polyp holders, are all grouped on parallel uh, a stipe. So that the, the actual um, animal has. Um, it's all together as one vertical unit um, and floating around. Um, you can see that they have different shapes, they have different spines out of them. Some of them are like tuning forks, not different sort of genera. Some of them have a W shape, here like that, and they are all different um, shapes and that's an, a really substantial late Ordovician record which has not previously been recognised in the state. So these are from all from New South Wales, and we've been gathering them since 2015, uh, and eventually they'll all be um, documented systematically and published. Next slide. And corals. I mentioned some coral reefs that were um, that have been described, and Barry Webby did a lot of this initial work back in the 19, late 1960s and 70s. So forth. But more recently, there's been several papers, one of them in our very own Linsock Proceedings, um, describing late Ordovician corals that were deposited, eroded, and then redeposited in, um, in groups of strata that are um, hundreds of years, hundreds of millions of years younger. Um, and so we've now got a very good idea of the stratigraphy of um, the late Ordovician corals from New South Wales. And John Pickett, who's in the room here, has done a lot of this work also from the Gunning Land area um, back in 2001. Next slide, we'll see a few thin sections of these. You study them by grinding the rocks, mainly limestone, away till um, you can see uh, light passing through them, about 50 microns thick. And um, they get um, solitary rugose corals, and a lot of these are colonial um, tabulate corals, and some chain corals, what you, uh, the halicidids and so forth. And the good thing about it is that in one instance uh, near, um, near Clefton Caves, we found conodonts in those very same limestone, so we can accurately date the, the corals. Unfortunately, this group here, which happens to be the very youngest um, Ordovician corals uh, assemblage in the state, uh, we tried for years and years to get conodonts out, and they don't seem to be there. Next slide, please. So, the conodonts have been very thoroughly worked out now in a series of papers, and here is an example of the late Ordovician ones. And this is a particular um, group of, um, of conodonts called, um, well, their, their genus name is Tashpagnathus, and that means that the, um, the genus is actually first described from China, one of the Chinese blocks, of which there were three in the Ordovician, and they are um, the spitting images of, uh, of that generic level, specifically three different species in New South Wales. So that this one then changes to this one, and then changes to that one, and you can see how this protuberance, they get a bit bulkier as they go up and younger. Right? As you go up in the stratigraphy, you get younger, and so you can determine 
quite readily where you are in the stratigraphy just by finding that species, which is quite remarkable. And then these are many other ones, Bellavina and uh, various other ones that we find. Um, and they are all found in the central western part of the state in all the limestones of which you might be familiar, Bruce Hill Caving, Cleveland Caves, um, and Bowen Park, another one there, and um, all these limestones um, generally yield these Ordovician canines. Next one, please. Next slide. Um, Ordovician canines can also assist if you care to dissolve them up completely, which is a bit of a shame, but there are plenty of them, um, in determining the sea surface temperature. Now, I mentioned this back on about the third slide, and we actually done a study in New South Wales about this by obtaining very nicely preserved, although not pristine, conodonts from this area and dissolving them up, getting the um, oxygen, uh, double ox uh, oxygen um, ratios out. And this was the uh, well known sea surface temperature um, uh, curve that was derived from 2008 uh, from the intracratonic uh, basins of which we've discussed several, the Canning, the uh, Amadeus, and these ones in the Northern Territory there. And the results from the central west of New South Wales on the volcanic islands, quite a different environment, was this one. Actually showing the temperature is warmer, even, than that 40 degrees. 42 degrees for a sea surface temperature in the equatorial regions. Quite remarkable. And for a while we thought, this is, this is our whack, it's something's wrong. Well, a paper has just been published, um, that one that actually was the one with all the maps in it, which actually reproduced a curve derived from Chinese samples, and they actually matched that curve better. So we're convinced now that, yes, 42 degrees C was your sea surface temperature in the Ordovician at the equator. So pre-cooked lobsters, but they didn't exist. So um, that was another way you can deal with um, with uh, conodonts and so forth. Next slide, please. Right, let's go into the deeper water one. So we're offshore to those volcanic islands. There are deep water turbidites, which are um, mainly chert sandstones that have actually slid down the the flanks of the islands, and. We have derived, uh, myself initially, and then Yong Yi supplementing it, a whole series of conodon zones in those deep water sediments. And this is quite remarkable. We'll go to the next slide and you can actually see some of these. All of those are not dissolved out of limestones because the limestones are not present in the deep water. These are from the cherts, cut thin section of the cherts, sufficiently thin for light to shine through it, just like your corals, the coral thin sections, and look what you see. And these are brilliant. They have been shattered up a bit, and you can see that some of these have got micro fractures in them, which means you could never dissolve them out. They'll just turn to dust. The scale bars are only 100 microns here. The things are tiny microscopic teeth. And we've got a whole series for the lower Ordovician, to the middle Ordovician and into part of the upper Ordovician, though not the top part. 28 genera and species have been identified in thin sections of cherts and siliceous siltstones from New South Wales in a publication just of last year. So that is remarkable. And the next slide shows some rather beautiful trilobites from this area, again the Gunning Ground area, which is a real, a real treasure trove of Ordovician fossils. Gunning Gland, centre of the universe, as I call it. But look, look at the condition, look at the preservation of these beautiful uh, new genus of Calaminid um, uh, pro far along. And this one, named after Barry Webby, is a really strange um, adonopleurid which has got these backward-facing spines uh, from the head with the, the eye tubicles here. That's the kephalon of the, um, the trilobite head. And they project back over the body, presumably as a defensive thing, so no one creeps up on it and tries to bite it. 
So there's some uh, beautiful trilobites of this age from these volcanic islands. Next slide, we're getting towards the end. Uh, plenty of nice brachiopods, which is my particular speciality, mainly from all the limestones that are shown here in black. Again, gunning land, cleft in caves and so forth. And these are dissolved out, and then SEM pictures are taken of them. And they range from the middle of the region up into the late of the region. I'd like you to take particular note of these two um, genera here. Atensoria is this one that's got a series internally, looks like rib cage in the, the centre of it. Really a strange thing. First found in Kazakhstan. And I should say, it's only ever found, it's only found elsewhere in Kazakhstan, in one of the terrains there, and in New South Wales. That's got to mean something biogeographically. And the spiny one, Nushbiella, another Kazakhstan genus, here. Right, so if we go on to the next slide, those same bugs, those same bracts, turn up, there's Nushbiella, there's Atensoria, turn up in North Queensland. So that particular little area, inland from Townsville, about 200 k's, 200 kilometres, has got the same coderons, the same brachypods. We can date them, or what we call correlate them, accurately together. We can say that they live in the same environment because these have particular depth assemblages. And so you can make a great deal of, get a great deal of information out and precisely correlate this right through, and then further correlate it to China, the two blocks in China. Great one. Next slide, please. And speaking of Queensland, uh, just last year I was involved in uh, describing the first Ordovician, late Ordovician, Katian, Shelley fauna from the northernmost part of the New England origin. Previously, this was only known in, in northern New South Wales to have fossils. This was the first time it was found in just a little tiny block of rock um, at Calliope, at Nick Calliope, and it turned up with trilobites and a lot of brachiopods similar to those in New South Wales. So we can again correlate. Next one, next slide please. And that, that noise must mean that I've got to finish up. And, in fact, now for something completely different. Are you aware that the Ordovician was a time of meteorite impact? It's known from Scandinavia there's a substantial record of meteorite impact into strata in Scandinavia. But we've got one potential Ordovician meteorite impact crater now known from Queensland. It's at Lawn Hill. There is a, an annulus or a, um, a, a flattened area with pushed up rocks be, behind, beside it, I've, surrounding it. I've not been there, but I'd like to. It's near Mount Isa. And it used to be thought of as the age of the structure impacted by the meteorite as being mid Cambrian, early to mid Cambrian. But in a recent paper, 2016, they've done argon argon dating of impact related melt particles to suggest an early to middle Ordovician age, 472 plus or minus eight. Well, that's not quite as good as the, as the ages we've been, the precision we've been getting with the, uh, the um, zircon ages. Um, well, you've only got argon and argon to, to deal with. That is still, even if you go either way from the, the uh, era bar, it's still within the Ordovician. So, and then you've got shatter cones and all sorts of Nice thing. So that's a nice one to end up on. Let's go to the last slide, I think. Yes, it's the summary. And so we've got established over the last decade. This is just information from the last decade on the Ordovician. In the intracratonic basins, in the, center, in the western two-thirds of the continent, we've established a de detailed conodont biosonation for the early and middle Ordovician sections. These have been integrated with isotopic age dating of the ash beds to get a really precise age dating of the Floium to Dependium in the canyon. We've recognized, in fact, seen recognised the oldest cryptospores known currently in the world, and spore-like organic world walled microfossils of un, currently unknown um, 
uh, and, and fairly enigmatic relationships in the lowest ordination determination. Shelly fossils have been described from the stairway sandstone, including those marvellous early fish fossils. In the Nolta Shelf, in far western New South Wales near Broken Hill, there's been a recognition of the internationally established Canberra Ordovician boundary with, with the identification of that conodon, the Apodignosus fluctivatus. And in the, west, the easternmost third of the country, with all the fog belts that have been um, accreted to the Cretonic um, Australia, Paleo Australia, we, in the, what's called the Tasmanides, the Victorian Raptolite Binder Zonation, which has not been um, touched for 30, 40, 50 years, has now seen substantial progress on refining it. Um, Graphites have been found uh, in both Victoria and New South Wales. Um, there's a decent, detailed biospherographic zonation established for all the conodonts uh, of the deep water, that's the ones in the church. We've fully uh, revised all the late Catian, that's late Ordovician, coral faunas in New South Wales, recognising close affinities that were previously unrecognised in North China. Um, all the lingonite brachiopods have been described now, and we've seen plenty of nice new trilobite taxa from New South Wales and Tasmania. All in all, 35 to 40 papers on the Ordovician only have been published in this last decade. 176 species described, 8 new genera, and 25 new species. Some of those in the Proceedings of the Linnaean Society of New South Wales. And there, I'll end it. Thank you very much. Thank you.